my name is uh, Ashley Manning. I go by Ash. My passions are hiking, backpacking, anything really outdoorsy. I really love the river. I love multi-day river trips and river running. I consider myself like a plus-size adventurer. I really like to fight for inclusivity and and uh, equity in the outdoors uh, that kind of reaches beyond just body positivity and into other realms of inclusivity. I definitely like punching up those who have felt othered in the outdoors. Tell me a little bit more about your, your childhood and growing up. Did you come from quite an outdoorsy family? Uh, yeah, I actually did. My father is, well, I guess I should say half and half. My father's a Department of Natural Resources um, game warden in the Northeast Georgia Appalachian Mountains. And he was pretty outdoorsy for me growing up. He would take me on hikes. Uh, My mom is absolutely not an outdoorsy person, but she has in recent years actually um, started hiking. So that's been pretty cool, but she was not a big part of my outdoorsy life. Um, My uncle was very outdoorsy and still is, and he would take me and my sister uh, pollywog hunting and um, really showed me the joys of owning amphibians. He had a ton of random amphibians, uh, which was super fun. But yeah, my, so my, my childhood growing up, I was pretty outdoorsy. We lived kind of far back in, so, so I'm from a really small town in the Appalachian Mountains, and we lived pretty far back in this one neighborhood on this mountain, and I didn't really have like any neighbors to kind of hang out with growing up, so I kind of just like played played around in the woods as a kid <laughs> by myself. <laughs> Did you say you you went pollywog chasing? Oh uh, yeah. Like, what? Uh, what's that? Like what? What is that? For somebody who's British, I've got no idea. Uh, tadpoles, like uh, big fat tadpoles that eventually become frogs or toads. Uh, they're the really big ones. I was gonna... <laughs> and what would you keep them as pets? Um, no, 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 no. We just catch them and release them. It was just fun to catch them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. For for work, what do you what do you do? It kind of depends on the season. (laughs) (laughs) So I think I was really introduced to this kind of outdoorsy, dirtbag, romantic lifestyle when I was about 21 years old. And I just kind of fell in love with it. It it was at that point in my life, I had I had gone from being a really outdoorsy child to being more indoors after high school. And for a couple of years, I just kind of stayed inside. I wasn't very active. I wasn't, you know, living a very exciting life. And I started hiking around that time. And my friend introduced me to this lifestyle, um, (laughs) raft guiding. (laughs) So in the summers, I raft guide and I have for years. And in the winters, I kind of just figure it out. And I know that sounds wild, but (laughs) um, when I say figure it out, Like I worked at a ski resort. I've done a couple of different things. I worked as a programs director at a couple of state parks. I sometimes just waitress or bartend or whatever kind of happens. And then this winter, since COVID's kind of been off the charts and going all the way around, I'm kind of just freelancing because I'm an artist as well. So I'm just freelancing. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So you said you got sort of reintroduced um, to the outdoors at when you when you were twenty one by a good friend. Take us back to that time in your life and why you really enjoyed you know getting outside again. So I feel like that in during that time of my life was a really important uh, lesson because around that time I started hiking actually for weight loss and I've kind of become this body positive person. Because through the years, I noticed that no matter what uh, diet or whatever I tried, it was kind of just a consistent thing. You know, I'd try really hard and lose a bunch of weight and then it just kind of come back gradually. So I just kind of started hiking for enjoyment, right? Well, my friend, she introduced me to rafting. So at that point, we had made friends because we had gone to the same high school. We didn't really know each other. And we started going to the same college and kind of fell into the same group because we like the same things like hiking and um, outdoorsy things like that. 
it, at first it kind of began when I was a little younger as group hikes, but as I started hiking more for enjoyment and less for losing weight, it kind of just became, yeah, I'll go, I'm going to go hiking and I don't really care if someone's with me or not, but you know, it was always a lot more fun if somebody was there. And then sometimes it was just more for peace, peace of mind. So sometimes being alone was okay. Right. So at that point I was still hiking with a lot of people and like going on these adventures, I was really concerned about, you know, giving off this image of being an outdoorsy person. So I think coming to terms with that, um, trying to prove people wrong that, um, like a fat girl or a big plus size girl could go hiking. And I know a lot of people don't like the word fat. So I understand if people listening to this don't like that word, but I try to use it to reclaim it. <laughs> but yeah, it, at that point in my life, I was still kind of doing this as an, as something of an image, like, Hey, look at me, this is what I can do. And I started rafting. Um, I got introduced to that rafting world at this point. And I think I just continued to tumble down this outdoorsy lifestyle road. And now I kind of just, I'll go paddling or go hiking alone. Um, for enjoyment, you know. Tell us a little bit more about the. See, I call it the Appalachian Trail, but I've noticed you call it the Appalachian. How do you say it? <laughs> so, <laughs> Appalachian. Appalachian, <laughs> yeah. Which is the correct pronunciation? Have I been pronouncing it wrong for years? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, there's a saying down here in in the south, um, in uh, in Georgia and southern states is um, it's it's not Appalachian. <laughs> I'll throw an Appalachia if you say Appalachian, but it's Appalachian. It doesn't really matter. I don't really care. <laughs> we'll just call it the AT, hiking on the AT. Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your dream to go and hike on the AT. When I was a kid, I remember my dad picking up through hikers <laughs> and giving them rides into town or talking about them because he kind of it was his job to kind of patrol around there. You know, he was the department of natural resources guy. And I remember hearing about it a lot and I had this big dream. I think, so my cousin was a huge influence cause she always said that she wanted to hike the AT when I was younger. And, uh, my cousin Michelle was a huge influence in my life overall she was super quirky and fun and, um, or she still is. <laughs> um, but she, she kept talking about hiking the AT, hiking the AT. And I think she will someday. I, I still think she will, but she's kind of got a family and everything now. But, um, so I think I heard a lot about the AT when I was younger and I kept saying through these years, like, I'm going to hike the AT. I'm going to hike the AT. And I was kind of just confused on when I would do it. I never really committed to it. I had these big dreams of like doing it in a certain amount of time and doing it a certain way. And then I think the dream kind of just started to fall into place uh, towards the end of my college. It was like, <laughs> I want to go and do this or at least try. And I, I was very motivated to make it to the end. And I, I, uh, I made this plan kind of roughly the year before uh, I was still in college and everything. And I was trying to work and save up for the AT. I was very motivated. And when I graduated, it was about two and a half months after I graduated college, I set out on the AT. Because I love what you said there. You said the dream fell into place. So, so you know, this is something you've dreamed about for a long time. You put a rough plan into place. You graduated college. What happened in those months in in between, you know, getting yourself prepared, getting yourself ready? What sort of, you know, research were you doing? How how did you make that dream a reality? It's funny you say that. The first thing that popped into my mind was kind of this feeling of shame. And I've, I've actually broached this topic before on other podcasts. Um, during the, there was a couple months right after like that in between time of right after graduating and then right before hiking the AT where I was working and that was it. And I'd like to sit here and say, I 
was hiking my butt off and exercising and mentally preparing and all of this stuff for the AT, but I wasn't. I was really nervous and I was super depressed. And because I had worked for, you know, I'd gone into college right out of high school and for uh, seven years I had worked to put myself through college and stay out of debt and try to save money and this, that, and the other. So I was kind of on this like full schedule where I never slept. I never, um, really took care of myself properly. And if I had a little bit of time, I was going hiking. And so all of a sudden I had all this time falling in my lap and I just wanted to fill it up with work, but it was hard because you can only work so much, I guess. And I, I was telling myself that I needed to train for the AT so that all my extra time would be spent training for the AT. But in reality, all that extra time was spent get it, being worried <laughs> and um, being concerned. And I, I laid in bed for, I remember having like three days off at one point. I just laid in bed like the whole time, just, just like scared and worried. And I didn't really know, was this something I really wanted to do? Am I just doing it? like to please other people or am I really doing it for myself? So there was a lot of like self reflection during those times, but, but there wasn't really a lot of like prep. And I think that that's a little disappointing probably for some people to hear, but there just wasn't a lot of prep. And I, I was very like ashamed of myself, very disappointed in myself, but I will say what I learned from that was that nothing will really prepare you for the Appalachian trail like doing the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> I mean, I had met people that had trained for months, years, training their body, going upstairs, running stairs, doing stairs in the gym, hiking, going up hills, down hills, et cetera, et cetera. And they still didn't feel prepared for the AT. <laughs> I mean, it's great if some people do. That's awesome. But I think with long distance hiking, nothing's going to condition your body like long distance hiking. If you can't devote eight hours a day to hiking, then you probably won't be super, super physically prepared for exactly what's about to happen to your body, you know? No. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting that the self-reflection was starting almost before you even got out onto, onto the trail and, and you used you know, so some of those words like, you know, feeling scared and, and worried and, and concerned about what other people were going to think about you and, you know, being nervous and, and depressed and having this, this full schedule, which to be honest, sounds exhausting. Like, you know, <laughs> seven, seven years of college, working a job at the same time, you know, trying not to, to get into debt. Like, I'm exhausted, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying, to, trying to imagine what that must be like. But you still, you still got yourself to the start line, which I think is a huge, huge achievement. What was it like on the start line for you? When I kind of announced that I was going to hike the AT, I had a friend who I never worked with at the company I was rafting at, but she had worked there previously and we kind of knew each other through that aspect of the company. And we weren't super close or anything, but she reached out to me. She was like, Hey, I'm planning on hiking the AT as well in 2018. We should maybe plan it together. And I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. And um, so she really did a lot of the planning. I'm very type B personality. I kind of have a loose idea of what I'm doing and then just kind of do it, which isn't everyone's cup of tea. And that's so that's totally fine. And I acknowledge that. But I was super stoked. Lindsay was you know, making this, uh, beautiful Excel sheet. She, she had an idea of where we were going to be, when we were going to be there and where to send packages. It was amazing. The amount of work she put into it. I really was impressed and was like, Whoa, this is next level and gorgeous. So her trail name was Dorothy. So I'll probably switch between Dorothy and Lindsay on accident. <laughs> um, but she and I were st I just remember kind of my mom or my dad and my sister drove me to the trailhead and Lindsay's family drove her to the trailhead and we got our numbers and our little like official AT hiker things and put them on our backpack. And <laughs> we took our little pictures. It was raining. So we were in our rain gear and 
it was like kind of this feeling of, oh God, here it is. <laughs> and we looked at the beginning of the trailhead and it was just absolutely disgusting and covered with mud. So we just walked on the road. <laughs> <laughs> we just walked on the road until we got to uh, the stairs. So at the approach trail, there's a bunch of stairs up Amicalola Falls, and we climbed the stairs. And it was very cold that day. It was a mess. It was nonsense. <laughs> we got to the shelter we were going to stay at on the approach trail because we weren't going to knock out a ton of miles the first few days. And we get to the shelter. We're chilling. And I'm like rummaging through my backpack and I was like, Lindsay, I think I forgot my pants. And she's like, what? <laughs> I was like, I, I forgot my pants. And I realized I forgot my pants, um, extra underwear, socks, like all this stuff that was just like, duh. I'd forgotten to pack a full pack and I was rummaging through my stuff. I had forgotten it all. And I was like sitting there in my uh, wet clothes from the rain and this in the, the sleet and i was like i, I gotta i'm gonna hike out I've, i'm gonna i'm gonna finish the pro trail and i did <laughs> my dad came and got me that night and it was dark i'd hiked out in the dark <laughs> and my dad came and got me and he was like are you okay <laughs> i was like i just feel disappointed but basically i came home got my stuff and then he took me back out there in the morning and i met up with Lindsay, <laughs> and then we went on our way but you know, these things happen, like this stuff happens, like it's just the reality of the situation. So after that, you then had all your gear, all your socks, your pants, your oh, underwear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it feels like every single person on the AT, it's never going to be what you think it is. It's There's always going to be some weird challenge that's going to be there that you're like, what even, how did this, why is this even a thing? Why is this even happening to me? Why was I why did I neglect so hard <laughs> to think about my pants? And they were just folded up on the floor. Like, I don't know how I didn't remember them. <laughs> you know? You obviously had a dream about the Appalachian Trail and, and what it was going to be like. What was the reality like for you out there? Like, did it <laughs> did it exceed your expectations? Did it was it just like this is not what I not this is not what I dreamed about? Like this is not what I was expecting. You know, I think, I think a lot of people go through this. And when I speak on this, I think a lot of backpackers and long distance hikers will probably agree. And some might just dis might disagree. And I never, ever want to paint this in a negative light. But there are a lot of things that happen out there that you just don't n know about until you're out there. And if you are not ready for that, it can turn into a negative experience. The first two weeks for me were spent like <laughs> laying down and like writhing in pain because I thought that I had stretched enough or I thought that I had done this and that, but my feet were swelling. I was like, wow, my body's really going through some changes. It felt like puberty almost where my body was, my metabolic rate was changing. My muscles were building and it was painful, you know, and it was at the end of those two weeks, yeah, I still felt pain throughout the trail. Yes, of course. But after those two weeks, my body was like, all right, it's a machine. I'm a machine now. So a lot of these experiences, uh, you you have to be comfortable in weather, any kind of weather. You have to expect the unexpected. And I think that a lot of people get this idea of what hiking the Appalachian Trail is and have no idea what a multi-day backpacking trip is because – they see these like fun, beautiful photos with blue skies and a big smile on a backpacker's face and they're having a good time. That happens, yes, but you have to be okay with type two and type three fun and type four. I mean, you know, emergencies where you make the best of an emergency and you look back on those times and you're like, okay, yeah, that was scary, but we made it through and it's a memory that lasts forever. You know, and type two fun is definitely just like kind of your average backpacking day, I think, where for the most part, like, you know, you're breathing hard, you're going and maybe it's raining and it kind of sucks. But then you kind of get to this point, maybe it's a beautiful river, maybe it's a beautiful, you know, outcrop and the clouds have gone away 
And there's all this, there's a beautiful balance, I guess is what I should say, where you are going to be met with many, many challenges. And some of them will not be pretty. And some of them will be kind of gross. <laughs> but it's all worth it. You know, it's um, sometimes you get the fun, beautiful picture with the blue skies and the big happy face. But sometimes you poop your pants because you have Giardia, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I think that accepting the reality of what a through hike is, is important. Yeah. What was your biggest challenge while you were out on the trail? So I did get Giardia and that's the big reason why I came off the trail. But that's I'm I'm going to push that to the side because that's a pretty obvious big challenge. But uh, I think my biggest challenge was kind of my mental health in the Smokies. So that's like not too far up the trail. But in the Smokies, I had several breakdowns. I thought that I was going to leave. It kept freezing over. There was like ice storms and snowstorms. It kept happening and I was really annoyed. <laughs> like I felt like I could never get warm and I was like tired of sleeping in shelters crammed up next to some stranger. And I was like, I'm sick of this. <laughs> like, where are the blue skies? Like I had this really big hump to get over and it was really tough for me mentally. I became jaded at one point where I was like, what am I even doing? Why am I doing this? And I think I also was very, like, as far as dealing with my own personal issues, um, I am very good at kind of pushing it down and, like, not addressing them. But when you're kind of out there in the middle of nowhere with no one but yourself to think, uh, like, talk to, I guess, like... I was just constantly thinking, you know, I did hike with people here and there, but for the most part, people have different paces. They hike differently and we'll just meet up at camp. Right. So all through the day, as I'm hiking, I'm just kind of thinking about things. And I wrote a blog while I was out there. And I think one of the lines that sticks out is, um, instead of running away from my problems, I started kind of like running straight to them and I was unable to avoid them. So it was a lot of like, kind of work, mental work, emotional work out there was probably my biggest challenge. I I think some people might say physical, but I really I physical was hard and everything, but it was it was the mental game for me. I mean, I think nature is an incredibly healing place, you know, being outdoors, being in the fresh air. And I think one of the most powerful things is this this privilege and this opportunity to think and reflect and on your on your life and the journey and decisions that have been made and you know things that have happened and you know things that have gone on in your life and and like you said there's no escaping it it's there all day every day and allowing you to like to have the the peace and quiet of the outdoors to actually process a lot of this a lot of this stuff which is going through mentally how did you keep on going when you were feeling jaded, when you were coming back to your why, when you're going through these, you know, you're going through this, these emotions which are being brought up and you're deep, you know, you're, you're going at it, you're dealing with it. You know, why did you keep going? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I think I, I could sit here and say I, I would call my, my family or my partner and – I remember I specifically was sitting on this wet, gross, grassy stump and there were bugs crawling all over me and I just didn't care. <laughs> I was like crying in the rain and I called my, uh, my sister and I was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And she was like, what? <laughs> You've been dreaming of this forever, you know, come on. And I was like, I don't know, you know, and the encouragement of others is definitely a, a huge factor. So I'm, I'm not saying that they didn't help at all, but at the end of the day, whenever I did want to come off the AT, no one was going to stop me. I think honestly, it was just like in the times that I wanted to quit so bad. And in the times that I would say out loud, I'm going to quit. I would think about quitting and what that meant for me and where I'd go and what I would do. So I would go back to raft guiding, which I eventually did. 
later on that summer. And I thought about how disappointed I'd, I'd feel in myself if I just came off the trail. Eventually, I kind of stopped feeling this way. I stopped feeling about disappointment and started realizing that I was just having a good time being out there. So when, so it stopped being about, oh, you're going to be disappointed in yourself and started being about, you're going to miss the trail. So at first, especially in the Smokies, I was like, you're going to be so disappointed in yourself if you stop now. But honestly, kind of looking back, if I would have stopped at mile 300 or whatever, I would have been proud of myself for walking for 300 miles. At some point, I probably wouldn't have been just then because even when I did leave the trail almost at 1,000 miles, I was really disappointed in myself. But how can you sit back and say I'm disappointed in myself after walking from Georgia to almost West Virginia? Like... (laughs) How can I sit here and say I'm disappointed in myself for walking that far? And how can anybody have the right to tell me that I should be disappointed in myself or they're disappointed in me for literally walking that far? I, you know, at that point, at the point of like coming off the trail, I was just sad that I was leaving the trail. And I think maybe some through hikers go through this where no longer are they going to feel disappointed in themselves, but rather uh, sad to leave the trail. Yeah. Tell everyone what your trail name was, is. Uh, <laughs> uh, my trail name is Yard Sale. <laughs> so tell us the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I did not want to take this name, but <laughs> it's it's cute. I was named by a man named Cece. So Cece was this older gentleman who had hiked the PCT, I think, twice and was on the AT. And he was with um, a couple of other hikers, Stickman, Frog, oh gosh, a couple of other ones too. And they were really sweet. Me and Dorothy loved them. But I got to camp one day and I was pretty notorious for this. I would just kind of like get to camp and turn my bag upside down and shake it out. And just all my crap would just come flying out of the backpack. Um, So I... (laughs) I said out loud, sorry for the yard sale, ha huh? <laughs> And CC was like, well, that's a trail name. And they had been trying to name me all day long. And people kept trying to name me. And I think trail name culture is so interesting. Like, if you don't have a trail name, people are going to try to name you. And it's interesting because you don't always have to take the first trail name that comes to you. I didn't. Somebody tried to call me John Lennon. Another person tried to call me Groovy. It's not my personality at all. <laughs> And also, like, you can claim the name for yourself, but Yard Sale kind of stuck because there was, like, a couple of other people camped there and they overheard. And I think when you are othered on the AT or long distance trail, meaning you are not a small white person. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, I I stood out like, you know, I was I'm bigger. It was very obvious when I came into camp that I was yard sale because I was plus size. Right. So a lot of people heard it. It kind of stuck. I claimed it. I kind of owned it. It's I stopped being ashamed of it. It was kind of (laughs) fun. Did you end up getting a trail family? I did. So um, Dorothy and I eventually split. There was no hard feelings there. We just were on two different paths. She was a lot quicker of a hiker than I. And um, she had a goal and she was going to reach it. And, you know, I was more like, uh, I like to linger. (laughs) I like to just kind of sit by a stream and watch the water sometimes. (laughs) So she would get to camp really early and I'd be rolling in like five hours after her. But we eventually split, and I hiked by myself for a couple of days. I think about a week, maybe. I'm not really sure. But at one point, and I had kind of bounced back and forth with seeing this one crew of people. And that crew of people included Mountain Cat, Cobra, Leslie Nope, Sparky, and Bunyan. And they kind of became my crew at one point. And Sparky and Bunyan kind of came and went, but Sparky 
I I remember seeing him in a field one time. I was camped out in the field all all by myself, and he walked by and he was like, "Hey, what are you doing?" <laughs> I was like, "What? <laughs> Hi." Um, and yeah, I think the next day after that, I kind of met up with them, and I was like, "Can I be part of your crew or something?" And they were stoked, and I was stoked, and kind of from then on out, or then until I left, uh, I was with them, and it was honestly like the bond you create with the people that you hike with is really intense. And I, I really love these folks and I'm actually hoping, uh, here very soon. So mountain cat and Cobra are hiking the AT again. They started in Canada and they're hiking down and they're getting closer to Georgia. So in about a month I will be back with mountain cat and Cobra hiking with them for the Georgia section. Talk us through your, your day, like an average day while you were out on trail. I'm going to explain like my average day once I became a little more experienced and then I might tell you what my day used to look like. So I would wake up typically around 530 in the morning and that was just honestly natural. It became pretty natural at one point. That was when the sun would begin to rise and the birds would start to chirp. So I'd wake up around 530. I'd get up and I'd drink a little bit of water and I'd pack all my stuff up and start hiking. I would not make breakfast because I typically would not be hungry at all at that point. And I'd start hiking and my hunger would start to kind of kick in about an hour after hiking. So I'd sit down, find a nice place somewhere. I'd usually try to hike to a water source is what I would try to do. Find a water source about an hour away from my campsite. If I couldn't, that's a that's okay. But I'd try to eat near a water source, uh, my breakfast and my breakfast usually consisted of something like a cliff bar and a protein drink. So I, I'd carry protein powder and this was, I can't remember if mountain cat or Cobra came up with this, but it was a game changer. Carrying protein powder was such a great idea. It was, it was really great. So I'd, I'd, uh, fill up the little baggy a protein powder with water and drink that down eat a cliff bar or some kind of bar <laughs> or i would have soaked oats overnight in a bag and i'd eat those and then i'd drink a bunch of water try to fill up my water source for the day and get going so that was kind of breakfast and then throughout the day i never really had like a lunch time really quote unquote if i did it would just be trying to time out like I try to get to some place that was fun to be at for the middle of the day to have, you know, quote unquote lunch. But I typically just kind of eat every hour throughout the day. I'm not talking like huge meals. It was usually like a bar or oatmeal or something of the sort, candy bars, peanut butter, tortillas with Nutella, <laughs> you know, some classic hiker snackies crackers i really liked crackers applesauce was big out there i don't know why i liked applesauce so much um <laughs> but i i was really big when we would get into town i really wanted fruit fruit and veggies because it's hard to carry that stuff out there so at the end of the day hopefully i would have met back up with my trail family and we're all at a campsite and hanging out and usually we'd all kind of hang out, maybe make a fire if we felt so inclined. And Sparky and Cobra were really, they hung their bear hangs really high. So it was always like really fun watching them just get their bear hangs insanely high. So that would happen. And then we'd eat dinner or something of the sort. And dinner was usually like the, the massive meal that I would eat. So I do like, you know, big carb bombs. Like um, I do like a mountain house meal mixed with ramen noodles or maybe I do ramen noodles with um, a pack of dried potatoes. And sometimes it's, it's kind of weird because sometimes your appetite is like out of control and sometimes it's not really there at all. So if my appetite wasn't really there at all, I'd try to eat or drink some kind of protein to finish the day. <laughs> How was it getting your gear together? Was it easy to find gear that was comfortable? Oh, um, so I was part of the through hike syndicate. I was given gear, my backpack, my sleeping bag, my tent by the through hike syndicate. 
As far as finding comfortable gear, it's absolutely impossible almost to find lightweight, um, super solid rain pants. I never had rain pants while I was out there, which meant that I was always wet on my bottom half if it had rained, which was just kind of something I had to deal with, which sucks, but it's the reality of being a plus size hiker. Raincoat, I use a frog tog. <laughs> I felt like I was going to get wet no matter what, so I didn't really care, which the frog tog was like good enough. <laughs> you know, it wasn't super great, but it wasn't super bad. And the backpack, so they gave me the backpack that I had already like projected to buy. Um, it's an Osprey pack and their 2018 Aurora um, model was was pretty good. I mean, I hiked with it all the way to in the end and I still use it to this day. However, I will say that their belt size isn't very inclusive at that model. Size inclusive, I, sh I should say, uh, it only goes out to a certain fit. And when I first began the trail, it did not fit very well. I have never had a backpack that sits on my hips. It always sits above my hips on, on my waist because my hips are too large. And most backpacks, including this one, dig into the into my back because I have a dump truck of an ass and it is <laughs> literally it will just dig into the back of my body, like right on the top of my butt. So I actually have scars on the top of my butt where it chafed me consistently all 982 miles. <laughs> it's pretty cool that you got a sponsorship. How did that work? I just kind of started applying to all of them, and I didn't expect to get any of them because a lot of people don't put a lot of faith in plus-size hikers. So I figured out that I'm kind of a decent writer. <laughs> uh, I didn't really know this. I'm okay. I'm an okay writer, and I... I think I probably wrote a pretty compelling reason as to why the Through Hikes Syndicate should sponsor me. The Through Hikes Syndicate's great. They work on trying to be more inclusive to people in the outdoors. They still have a little work to do, I will say that. But yeah, they they work on inclusion and I think they saw me as an opportunity to have a plus size hire on there. And um so that's how that came about. Yeah. You left the trail after 982 miles was that because of the i've forgotten the word the guardi gadia the shits the vomiting yes. and the shits yeah <laughs> yes it was the shits it was it so it was partially the poo poo i started getting very sick and I, <laughs> my poor trail family i woke up one night and like had pooped my pants and we were at a brewery camped outside of the brewery and i was throwing up and just like Ugh, like so sick and I I remember like telling them the next day I was like guys I am very sick I don't know what's going on I thought I just had like norovirus so I kept hiking I kept hiking for about a week and it just kept getting like worse and I couldn't keep food down we go to resupply and I just have just as much food as I had you know when I started and it was like ah I don't know like what's going on with me I was getting really weak my mental health was deteriorating quick and so I thought about coming off trail and staying at a hostel in uh, Ferry, but honestly, I just didn't have the money at all. I had probably just enough to make it to the end if I really wanted to, but that did not include hostels at all. And it definitely didn't include two weeks of being in a hostel waiting for Giardia to settle down. So I think with that whole thing, it was a mixture of, yes, I was sick. I did not have the funds to go get better and be away from home. And also due to the dehydration, due to the lack of eating and due to being sick, my mental health was just really deteriorating. So it was a mixture of all three. And then kind of to tack a little bit on, my uncle had passed away uh, while I was out there. And I was feeling very guilty about not being home for my mom and my aunt and I was not home for his funeral either. So I was feeling a little guilt about that. So the decision ultimately was made to go home and just kind of rest up and see where I was at. I was planning on trying to work a little bit, get some money and maybe meet back up with my trail family. But that didn't happen. <laughs> How long were you out on the trail for? Um, About three and a half months. 
a long time like yeah. to, to be out in the to be out in the in the woods for that length of time how was it after recovering did um you know get getting better were you able to look back with a sense of accomplishment and and to see like do you know what I walked a thousand miles on the or you know 982 miles on the Appalachian Trail like did you feel that or do you, do you feel that now so now I definitely feel it so when I came back home my mom had to come get me it felt like such a defeat because I was like mom can you come get me from Virginia I'm I'm done and we tried to find like a bus or a plane ticket or something but <laughs> I had lost my uh ID <laughs> somewhere <laughs> so my mom such a sweet sweetheart she drove all the way up grabbed me and drove me back and she <laughs> she was like girl why did you lose your ID <laughs> but so I, when I first came back you know I honestly I cried for most of the like eight hours of driving <laughs> for my mom I was like crying and just like upset and oof when I think about it I get a little emotional but my mom was just like (laughs) you know um it's okay you don't you don't have to cry and I was like I can't stop crying so I felt very defeated and I felt very disappointed and sad I was really sad that I was leaving the trail I was sad I was leaving my friends I was sad that I wouldn't reach Katahdin I was sad I was so sad and when I got back initially I started raft guiding again after I kind of recovered a little bit. I was still actually kind of sick when I was raft guiding again. And then I I guided for a while. I was trying to get more money, recover, and then I was going to return to the trail. And I tore my ACL raft guiding. (laughs) I completely, like, I was on a trip. And during that trip, my knee was just totally obliterated. So there was no way I was going back on the trail that year. Um, I had to have surgery. It was honestly a really, really like hard time. I had gone from starting 2018 by hiking the Appalachian Trail and coming back and raft guiding. Mind you, I'm insanely like physically active at this point. And then it was just nothing. I couldn't move. And that was a really hard part of my life was watching my trail family reach Katahdin and being really proud of them and happy for them, but knowing that I was supposed to be there with them. Yeah. How's your ACL now? Have you recovered? Yeah, I had surgery uh, later on that year and recovered. It still, you know, hurts here and there, but I think that's just kind of part of it is like, you know, if I do really long hikes, it, you know, it hurts, gives me a little bit of trouble, but it's definitely recovered and I'm hiking now and I'm trying to uh, get it together to where I can finish the AT. <laughs> yeah. You've already done a massive chunk of it. So it's almost just um, like section hiking. You've done, you know, you've done your first section. Yeah. When, when do you think you'll get back out there? I know it's definitely difficult with COVID and everything else, but have you got plans to, to do that at some point in the future? I definitely wanted to get back out there this year, but I don't think that is going to be an option at least for a while because of covid yeah i might try to see what's going on towards the later half of the year and see it might be kind of a spur of the moment type of deal (laughs) you know it might be like all right well i'm going and then go but it also could be something that happens in 2022 or 2023 i do want to get back out there and i do want to hike the rest of the at i also want to do a couple of other long distance hikes You know, I think that a big part of the past couple of years for me has just been like, when is this uh, knee going to heal? And it's like a, you know, I've definitely passed my 18 months of recovery, but it's, it it was still like those 18 months were just like me being like, oh my God, when can, when can I hike? You know, I, when can I go? When can I go? And I was testing the limits like all the time. Ashley, what advice would you have for for other hikers who, you know, they want to get out there, they want to get out and spend more time in the outdoors, on trails, in the mountains? You know, what what are your top tips and advice? I would say don't be afraid to go out there. I think that a big misconception that is thought about is how absolutely horrifyingly dangerous it is to (laughs) go hiking and go backpacking. I think a big response that I got whenever I'd tell people that I was hiking the AT is, are you going to bring a gun? Is that safe? Blah, blah, blah. 
I'm not going to sit here and tell you it is 100% safe. You know, there have been instances occurring that are terrible. But if you focus on the terrible things that have happened the few amount of times and not the big picture, then you're going to scare yourself. Don't be scared. I think go out there with enough caution, be aware of your surroundings, but you know, go out there and do your thing. It's uh, not a big deal. You know, I think being prepared is really um, important, you know, being prepared with the right kind of gear, the right kind of clothing and the right kind of aid if you need it. So taking into to account, like, where are you and what kind of environment are you in? How far away is help? Do you have phone service? Do you need a satellite phone? How long will you be out there? I think that there's lots of ways to be prepared. And don't let anybody tell you that you're overprepared unless it is absolutely harming you. Like if you have a metal pot that you're carrying and it's not necessary. But, you know, if you're overprepared, quote unquote, for a day hike, it's probably okay. Like, don't let anyone judge you for being overprepared. You know, if someone falls and hurts themselves and you've got the satellite phone and there's no service around, then that's awesome, you know? And actually, where's the best place for people to find more information about you to follow your journeys online? Where should they go? I have an Instagram. Ashley's Adventure is the Instagram. I'm working on a website right now. Uh, I don't have it up, so unfortunately... I can't give you the domain, <laughs> but I will be posting that when it's up. I'm also going to be posting some uh, content on TikTok here soon, and you can find that. It is uh, it is also Ashley's Adventure on TikTok, and, and you can also find more information on these sort of things that I'm really passionate about on, like, Unlikely Hikers. That's a page and a website I really suggest following and I love the person that runs it. Her name is Jenny Brusso. And so that's really where I'm active. Perfect. I'll make sure that I add the links to your Instagram, to your TikTok, and to the Unlikely Hikers Instagram and webpage as well. Um, But actually, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast and sharing more about your passion and love for the outdoors. It's been awesome to speak with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Ash Manning. My name is Sarah Williams. I am the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges. I do like to keep things simple, which is why for quite a few of the episodes, there isn't actually any introduction at the very beginning. It's about seven seconds of music and we just get straight to the episode because I just want to give you quality content. I want you to hear these incredible stories and amazing women. And I'm just so excited to all of our new listeners who are joining us today. So thank you so much for tuning in. You can find more information about, about me and my background and what the mission is for Tough Girl Challenges, which is to increase the amount of female role models in the media. And if you go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com, you can find loads more information. Just want to say a big thank you to Donna Gavin and Rowena Harding, who have both signed up to be patrons of the Tough Girl podcast. So thank you so much. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free. And that's thanks to these individual patrons around the world who are supporting the work that I do. So I really do appreciate every single patron. We're around 269 patrons at the moment, which is absolutely fantastic. So hopefully we will get back up to 270, then 280, then 290, and we'll hit the magic of 300 patrons, which would be incredible. Just want to do, um, well, two quick mentions, really. Ashley talked about it during the podcast. She mentioned Unlikely Hikers. Please do go and give them a follow on Instagram. The links are all in the show notes. And they also have a podcast as well. And Ashley's been on on episode eight. I was think it's really fascinating to listen to the same guests sort of being interviewed because different interviewers bring out different questions well they ask different questions they have different views different perspectives and so it'll be quite fascinating to listen to that episode as well talking about brand new podcasts I've got another podcast for your list as well 
It's called Living Life Differently. So let me just tell you a little bit more about it. So if you've ever wanted to live life a bit differently, but feel stuck and unable to take the leap of faith, then be inspired by the Living Life Differently podcast. Ali and Amy speak with different women who live alternative lifestyles, from someone who packed up a 400 pound ex-builder's van and moved to France, to another woman who lives life, life as a bicycle nomad. Their guests share personal insights into the way they live life differently and their journey of how they got there. Ali and Amy are currently living life differently with their newborn son and dog in a static caravan on a farm in South Wales. They are patiently waiting to start a European camper van adventure once the pandemic restrictions ease up. So I've listened to the first episode, absolutely loved it. So well done, Ali and Amy. And Ali is Ali Mahoney Johnson, who I met, gosh, it must, it was either the Women in Adventure Expo in 2015 or 2016, but, um, it's been, I've interviewed Ali the Tough Girl podcast and she's written a book about cycling from Wales over to Chamonix and she's talked about that on, on the Tough Girl podcast so please do go listen to that episode and Ali's also interviewed me talking about sort of mental resilience and mindset in relation to the Marathon de Saab so you can also listen to that episode on the Tough Girl podcast as well so absolutely fantastic oh and another podcast if you haven't listened to it already go and give Extraordinary Ordinary Women podcast a, less, a, less, a lesson a listen um, and that's done by Frankie Diwa and I've also um, been interviewed on that podcast as well. So if you want to hear more about me, go and take a listen to those episodes. But wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you're having a fun time. I hope you're enjoying yourself. I know times are tough at the moment, so I'm sending everybody big virtual hugs. But thank you again for all your incredible support. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast go live on a Tuesday and Thursday, 7 a.m. UK time. So hit that subscribe button, subscribe, Tell a friend about the Tough Girl Podcast and sign up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.